Welcome back, pet parents. We're going to do something a little different today, and I really hope you like it because in my head, this is going to be so fun. And um, I thought, what better person to test this out on than somebody who's been here more than anybody else, by the way. This is officially like you've been here more than anybody else, so congratulations. I'm going to have to like make a like a smoker's jacket or something for you. What do they do on SNL that like you're the five timers club? I don't know, SNL. but I'll, I'll take anything for free. Make a jacket for you or something. Um, but we're going to do something totally different. And thank you so much for being my um, test subject, Billy. Oh, of course. I am happy to be here anytime you want. Thank you. So um, in the event, this is the first time you're tuning in, Billy Hookman with Green Juju is my guest. Um, he's been on the podcast numerous times. Please go check them out. So we're going to start, first of all, all, Green Juju just announced a new product. I'm super excited about it. We're going to talk about it, but we're going to talk about it a little bit later. Um, so stick around for that. But what we're going to start off with is a little game called did billy say it <laughs> oh that's hilarious i'm gonna be really bad at this i will tell you that right now so every time i talk to you you're like i don't remember what i said i have no idea maybe i said that <laughs> somewhere at some time so i went back through some of your past content some past content from other people and I'm curious as to if you know if you said it or not. So I, I want to start us off by saying I had a funny moment with Krista Fox um, of Pug and Hound. Uh, we, we, I was at the store and she was saying, she was talking about this. She's like, oh, I learned so much at this presentation you gave on glutathione. And I was like, well, I don't even remember doing it. So <laughs> I'm so glad you learned so much from that. Uh, maybe I should brush up on it again, but um, so that was a, a funny moment and could be probably a precursor to what we're about to do. So hopefully I do okay. Well, I didn't find your glutathione presentation because I'm actually really interested in that. So now I've got to find that. Um, so I'll make a note for myself <laughs> to find that. If you um, find it, let me know because I would like to see it as well. Yeah, I, I might have to ask Krista about it. Um, okay, so I, to be fair, I feel like this is going to be really, really easy for you. But <laughs> we'll see. Um, the point is that it's supposed to be fun, whether or not it's easy. Um, so the very first one should be the absolute easiest. So hopefully we'll see. Um, did you say, my dog is not a landfill? I did say that. Yes, Very I did say that. Yes. And I know the context. I was talking I was, I was talking about AFCO meetings or something. Yes. Um, yes. And it, it is true. He is uh, a wonderful boy, and he is not a landfill. <laughs> okay. So um, that you are correct, by the way. You did say that. Um, I like, I like that now I'm telling you what you said. Um, <laughs> wait, I have one more side story as well. Okay. Please. Um, one, one time this has got to be like, I don't know, eight years ago or something, but one time I don't really comment online, uh, on things like just generally. Um, mm -hmm. and so, but We're all so, aware. Someone, someone, brought, someone, uh, someone brought to my attention that there were two people who were arguing about something I'd said. Um, I think it was on something about garlic, but I, they were going back and forth and I just went to the th comment thread and I was like, oh, hey, it's me. And this is what I said. And one of them was like, no, you didn't. And I was like, no. <laughs> okay, I am an expert in what I say, I think. If I'm an expert at anything, uh, at least, you know, so then I was like, oh yeah, this is why I don't comment online. Fair point. Um, yeah, I, I totally get that. It is uh, not a pretty place to be a lot of times. So, okay, next one. They say we must have a food absolutely devoid of any microbiome. 
They say we must have a food. I don't think I said that. Okay. So I, I figured these would be kind of easy because people, people just talk, like they have different like affects that, that have the way they talk. So you did not say that. You're absolutely correct. That was Dr. Ian Billinghurst. Mm. Um, on the BK Petcast, who said that? Oh, was he talking about like fermentation and? Um, he was, was just talking, talking about myself? food regulation in general and how they uh, don't want any bacteria present. Yes, that um, is very true. Yeah, but you didn't say it. See, you were right. You didn't no, say it. No, no, and I have never met him. Although I've met a lot of people, but I feel like I, I don't think I've ever met him. But he lives in Australia, right? That's a good question. I don't know. I, don't know. I, I don't think know. so. And I think that's probably not, but he's done a lot of great work over the years, obviously. So. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, love his work. I haven't met him either, but um, that will be changing. So, um, okay. If you want soil probiotics, eat the soil. I don't think I said that. Did I say that? Oh. <laughs> I mean, it's good. I mean, it's, it's absolutely brilliant. Uh, no. Um, I love how you're like, oh, I said that. It's absolutely brilliant. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> absolutely. A complete banger. So what do you have the reference for that? What, what was that? So it was on... Um, you, oh, gosh. Who were you talking to? I, you were talking to somebody, and they transcribed it for an Adore Beast blog. Um, you were, it was really about eggshell membranes, but oh, you know, you yeah. talking about soil as well. Yep. Or probiotics, I guess, in general. Yes. Yes. I know which article you're talking about. At least know that. So. <laughs> um, okay. The science is telling us that we were all wrong about HPP and pet foods. See, I agree with that statement, but I don't feel like I would phrase it in that way, but maybe I would. Um, I'll say yes, because I was maybe thinking about we all being the people who were against it and not encompassing of all, all people. So yes. Okay, I did. Okay, good. There you go. You did say that, and you said that on this podcast. Oh, Okay. Yeah. And that was pretty recent. So, yeah, I, I'm trying to be very careful in just generally in life with how I word things. And I really like words. Um, so it's funny to analyze these because I'm like, well, should I have said that that way? I don't know. So, okay, <laughs> I did say that. Well, I'm glad you are enjoying this. Um, okay. It's a strange quirk of dogs that we can target them to eat pretty much any material, meat, vegetables, or dry food. However, it says nothing to, to its long-term suitability to that animal. Okay, I got two things on this. Number one, that's not me. And number two, that's Connor Brady. <laughs> How do you like me now? See? Love it. Yay. I must be, I must be a nerd. Uh, and I'm excited to, I'm actually going on to the raw pet, raw pet medics, um, show next week, oh, yeah. but I'm excited to meet Connor, um, in person. I've obviously met him aside from that, but, um, I like that, that crew cause they try to think outside the box and that's what I like the most in, in nutrition. So. Yay. Sorry, you didn't. Yeah. You didn't ask me for like a breakdown yeah, every time you do one of these, but this is where I'm at apparently. I no, I love it. I love it. Please. Um, uh, okay, so I don't think I want to do the other ones. Let's move on. Okay. Um, oh, I actually this recently came up, and I wanted to just ask you. So this is just going to be a bunch of random questions. We got some true false. We got some multiple choice questions coming up. But um, this one is just kind of a open-ended, please tell me your thoughts. Um, is there a nutritional difference in a fertilized egg versus a non-fertilized egg? Uh, that is a very good question. I think there is a nutritional difference, but I don't think, as far as I know, having 
I believe I went down that rabbit hole like a really long time ago. Um, I don't think it is. What I found was I didn't think it was significant enough in order to um, in order to sort of like go through the exercise of really trying to find fertilized eggs. It's kind of like, um, you know, locally I can get colostrum at certain times, which is amazing and, and, and is, you know, like concentrated raw milk almost. But like, if you can't like, you know, feeding raw milk is just great in general and we'll have all essentially all the same things just in more like diluted amounts. So I think it was kind of the same thing where it was kind of like, there's probably some more benefit to it, but it just didn't vary enough to where I thought to myself, like, Oh, this is something I need to do or would give like, I think that's what we have to look at in nutrition is like, especially with new stuff is like, does this variant of something we're doing provide enough actual nutritional value or difference to, to really like get people to do it? Um, mm -hmm. now I could be wrong. There could be someone listening to this being like, I'm an, egg, I'm an expert on fertilized eggs and you get all these different things, but I, that's, I'm pretty sure that's the conclusion I reached. That's pretty much what I've found online as well. Um, is that if there is any nutritional variation, it's so, min it's like really, really minimal, but, um, like it kind of went on to talk about, you know, you're, you're going to find better nutrition if you're paying more attention to like pasture raised yeah. chickens and things like yeah. that. So like focus on the right thing. Dummy yeah. is what it was telling me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so that's the best I can do there. Okay, cool. So um, I think these true or false questions are just way too simple. So we'll just kind of breeze through them. Um, True or false, dogs need a variety of foods in their diet to meet nutritional requirements similar to humans. Uh, I would say true, sort of like uh, in the sense of like, I don't think it's true that like, I think if people and dogs have variety but eat a small amount of like the healthiest possible foods, right? Like if, I, you know, so true with saying like, Variety only in things that are healthy and not things just for the sake of variety's sake. Like I wouldn't want it. I don't think a animal would be healthier if they were eating 17 different foods, uh, six of which were kind of like junk foodie or highly processed versus, you know, you know, um, eating like five or six things. But yeah, I mean, especially with the variance of, nutrients in whole foods and even whole food formulation and, and that kind of thing. I definitely think um, as much as you can get into your dog or cat's diet from your own refrigerator and, and the pet store is the thing to do. So I should not add potato chips into rotation. <laughs> uh, Huckleberry got a pork rind last night, um, but that's arguably like, you know, it is cooked, but it is also just pork cooked in its own fat. So it's arguably healthy as well. Um, and that, oh, okay. <laughs> well, no, but I, for, as far as a snack food, pork rinds are very healthy, but, um, yeah. I just mean for him specifically, although, and yeah. part of that was cause we were gone for like eight days. So, although he might like the dog sitter better than us anyway. So. Aww. Aww. Um, okay. So true or false. Providing your dog with a diet rich in antioxidants can help reduce the risk of chronic diseases. Uh, that is true. True. Yes. Antioxidants can help fight off free radicals. I love these like buzzwords and reduce the risk of chronic diseases in dogs. Yay. Okay. So I thought those were going to be way too easy for you. Well, side note about antioxidants, which is interesting because I just started down this little sort of like rabbit hole or whatever is... So I, I, I sort of have this need to just continually make things for, you know, it's just why I love my job so much, but also just in general. So I've been, I've been making, uh, you know, a lot of gummies for the dog recently, and I was uh, wanting to incorporate some more teas. So I was incorporating green rooibos tea. Um, and it's actually interesting. There's 
that that's, that plant is only actually grown in one part of Africa. Um, it's not grown anywhere else in the world. And there's this, I, I don't know, like I said, I just started sort of looking into this, but there's actually an antioxidant compound in it that doesn't exist in any other food um, oh. on the planet. And so I do think that's interesting because most other things you see, everything in nature is made of the same thing. So you see those things. So it's, it's just kind of interesting to find a food that has a specific, you know, um, I just have to see like how much it's been studied and that kind of thing. But, but yeah. yeah. And why, why it would exist in that location of the world and nowhere else. Yeah. It's interesting. I don't, I, I don't know if it's just like the climate um, specifically, but I did make the rooibos chamomile ginger gummies for him last night and update. He did eat it this morning. So that was good. He liked them. Yes. Good. Good. I, I don't venture into those areas very often because my dog, as we have talked about, is so picky. So picky. If it is not meat, there is no way this girl is taking it from you. <laughs> she will, she'll be nice sometimes. Like if I hand her a carrot or something, she'll like gently grab it and then walk a couple of feet and turn around and drop it on the floor. Yeah. <laughs> like, okay. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> now I get to clean it up. Um, yeah. Some dogs are really like that. I mean, it's, I, I, you know, I will say that Huckleberry definitely eats like, you know, the egg yolk and the food and, you know, those components first, the sardine or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. He does eat the vegetable. He does eat our blends and it is a huge, you know, a huge part of his uh, nutritional success, but he does definitely eat everything that's animal based first. So. Yeah, that's well, even, um, what was it that she didn't eat? I made a, like a board for her a couple of years ago and just had all kinds of different things on it. And she left scrambled eggs, which shocked me and blueberries. She left them. She was like, no, I'm done. Uh, I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, he would not leave blueberries. I can tell you that. He does love those. Okay, so let's do some multiple choice. That's too easy. Um, I think all of these are going to be too easy for you, but let's, let's go for it. Omega-3 fatty acids are important in a dog's diet for A, improving coat shine, B, supporting joint health, or C, both A and B. I'm going to go with C and say both A and B. Yes. There you go. I'm, I, I'm tallying up all of the gold stars. Oh, good. Okay. I'm, I'm okay. hoping to get I'm extra not. credit. So. I'm not. Well, you did get extra credit. What did you get extra credit on? You got extra credit. Oh, with Dr. Connor Brady. Oh, there you okay. go. You yep. got extra credit there. Okay. Um, okay. Which of the following is a benefit of feeding your dog a diet that includes dark leafy greens? A, reduces the risk of cancer, B, increases energy levels, and C, both A and B. Um, I'm going to also, uh, I'm, well, you think to yourself, okay, it's C because it can increase energy levels, but does it mean increase energy levels based on just like overall health or, I mean, because they're not, they're not taking energy from those specific dark leafy greens, right? Because they're, they're essentially low in everything that you can derive energy from, but you'll be healthier. So yes, see both of those things. Well, um, chat GPT disagrees. And oh, <laughs> are they saying just a, they're just, they're saying just a, but I get where you're coming from and I totally understand that. I'm more complex than a robot. That's my, yeah. uh, I'll say that uh, I, I'm sticking to it. No, I just think. Um, I like that. So your dog is not a landfill and you are more complex than a robot. <laughs> yes. I, uh, there we go. Actually, the people who know me really well would, uh, would argue that point about the robot, to be honest with you. They would say, you're really not more complex than a robot, sir. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, yeah, I, I think it's, it's B as well because I think the healthier you feel, and or your body less inflammation you have you'll you'll have more energy so i disagree with the robot that's that a one. very good point that is a very good point um feeding your dog turmeric 
can benefit them by A, supporting joint health, B, boosting the immune system, or C, both A and B? Let me go with C. Um, and anyone that's listening to this should buy Lewis fermented golden paste mm -hmm. um, yeah. at a local store near you. So what is so special about it's fermented? Why it is, why is that so special? It is fermented. Um, well, the first thing is it's special because it's named after my dog. Um, the second thing that makes it special is we're doing the whole route. Um, so it's not just curcumin, right? It's other sort of plant compounds and, and that, that are present. So it is the whole root. It's not like a powder or something like that. And then the second part is, you know, we do do the wild fermentation on it, which is essentially going to, um, it pre metabolizes the curcumin. So your body, your dog or cat's body doesn't have to do that. So like if you were to eat it, your body would break it down into metabolites. And that's a huge benefit of fermentation is the, the bacteria eating the food for you. They're pre digesting it to some degree. And so this will actually turn it into metabolites. So your body doesn't have to do that. So it's much easier to absorb. Um, and we've been, we've had, you know, since that product's been out sort of in regard to like testimonials and stuff that I've heard of people using it, we've had incredible testimonials for, inflammation, you know, energy, even though, you know, chat GPT disagrees with me there, but, um, you know, energy and just the general use of the product. I mean, it's, it's amazing to me when you develop things like that and people are like, you know, we couldn't get it for three weeks and my dog, you know, just can't function the same way. And it's, it's like a lot, it's a lot of, it's like a lot of responsibility, you know, uh, but it's a really cool thing to hear stuff like that. So, so go get some Lua's golden paste. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, okay. I, now, now I'm like really scrutinizing these. Um, I don't want those. Okay. Which breeds are more predisposed to musculoskeletal diseases? A, Bulldog and Pug. B, St. Bernard and Great Dane. Or C, Yorkshire Terrier and Dachshund. Um, I'm not great with breeds. I'm gonna go with I'm either going to go with A or B. I feel like I, I would normally go with A, but then I, I'm thinking about the skeletal structure of like Great Danes, you know? I'm just going to go with B. There you go. Okay, let's go with B. You are correct. Oh, good, Larger good. breeds. Yeah. Larger breeds do have, um, uh, are more predisposed to musculoskeletal disease. That's true. Although I do think, you know, this is a controversial point. But I do think that the calcium to phosphorus ratio on large breeds thing is just totally, it's relevant, but it's not as relevant as people make it out to be. I mean, I've seen in the past 12 years, I've seen so many large breed dogs that are raised from puppies and are just anywhere between that one to one to two to one calcium to phosphorus ratio. And they're totally great. Like the idea that we have to like come up with a large breed food and have this calcium thing, I think is, it's one of those things in nutrition where people kind of overblow something, it, it becomes their thing. And then, and then, you know, it's like, this is what everyone needs to go by. But like I said, like, if you look at a lot of like the, some of like the feeding trial stuff with um, all life stages food, including large breed, you know, uh, the calcium levels, I don't think have to be exact. So um, just throw that out there. Well, yeah. And sometimes, a lot of times I wonder if these are just like just symptoms of like the high processed food diets, like, oh, this highly processed food has not been working for these breeds. So we need to adjust it and not really like based on real food. Yeah. Well, and also I just think it comes from like, you, you join a forum 
and it's large breed forum. And people are like, if you don't do this, this can happen. Right. Mm -hmm. But that this can happen is never like, it's always this existential thing that exists somewhere else. Right. And so like, if you, if you had a large breed puppy and didn't give them calcium, I think that would be a, a disaster, but I think there's a huge difference between that and, you know, hitting a specific calcium level. It's, it's, it's sort of like, um, if you use more organ meat, this can happen. But what is the, did we actually, do we, what are, do you know anyone that this happened to? What are the cases of this? What, how do we actually do that? And so that I'm more interested in that. I'm more interested in, in that. And I, and I try to draw upon um, just formulation and having dogs. Like, here's a great example of that. We have, our freeze dried food has been out for a, a, like a year or a little bit over a year. And we obviously did some pre-work with that food, right? And we do formulation work and um, we continue to do that. And that's important stuff. But the most important metric that we have right now is we've gotten amazing results from the people who are actually feeding into their dogs in the field and like out in the world and people who are actually like feeding it in actual life, meaning they're giving treats, they're, they're, you know, giving blueberries, they're whatever they're doing. And so that to me tends to be the, uh, the best metric for whether the food's actually working versus some of those other metrics that you still want to hit. So I want to hit that it's complete and balanced and et cetera, et cetera. But how does it actually feed? And so that's, that I think is more important. So I think most large, basically almost any large breed dog could get onto a food that is calcium and phosphorus balanced. And you're going to get essentially the same results that if you used a specific food for large breed puppies, in fact, you might get into a worse result because then you might be feeding something that's not as good nutritionally and some other factor, right? Okay. Yeah. So my internet was buffering, so hopefully I got all that. <laughs> yeah, how dare um, you? I'm gonna walk off. Aw, you would not do that to me. <laughs> okay. Um Okay, I'm trying to be like really, really picky now because of the time. Okay, this this is just hilarious, so I have to ask. Um, which of the following foods is toxic to dogs? A, cooked vegetables. <laughs> B, raw meaty bones. Or C, grapes. Okay, I mean, do we really need to answer that one? I, well, you know, I, I didn't think so, but then I just found it hilarious. A so. cooked vegetables. Oh so, so feed green juju, <laughs> which are completely raw. So there you go. Okay. I will take that. Feed it our veggie blends and you, you can Is avoid that, the death You want to phone a friend. <laughs> <laughs> I can do that. I'm going to call Kelly. <laughs> okay. Um, well, okay, I can't ask you that because you've already answered that. Um, what is a key factor in formulating a balanced raw diet for dogs? Maintaining a high carbohydrate content. I'm sorry, that was A, by the way. Maintaining a high carbohydrate content. B, ensuring a proper balance between omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids. C, including a variety of grains for energy. <laughs> Sorry, I can't keep a straight face. D, exclusive use of plant-based proteins. I think it was B, right? <laughs> I think it was B. Um, ensuring a proper balance between omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids. You are absolutely right. Yes. I would like to add a caveat to... Not a caveat. I would like to add something to this because I like to get in, you Please. know, just my random thoughts on these things. Okay. Omega three to six is incredibly important, as we've talked about before, and uh, I talk about a lot with our foods and how we formulate them. But keep in mind, if you if your animal eats a meat based diet, 
most of the fat they're getting is saturated fat. It, the saturated fats will make up around 50% or over of the diet itself. So, because people always, even in the dog world, they talk bad about saturated fat generally. But so just keep that in mind. So if you're if you're saying something about um, coconut oil and people shouldn't use it because it's it has saturated fat in it. Well, your dog's diet is made up of a, you know mostly saturated fat as well because it's actually the healthiest fat. So that's my little tidbit on that. I actually read something really interesting about saturated fat the other day, and I. God, I hope I don't butcher this, but I probably will. Um, Alzheimer's specifically. So it was about the progression of, you know, the stupid things we humans do and the demonization of saturated fats and switching from animal fats and butters over to like seed oils. And um, that the, like that there's like this, period of time when we really started pushing hard for like getting away from animal products and using more seed oils, <clears throat> excuse me. And this is around the seventies, I think it said, don't quote me on that. And that's kind of when we started seeing a lot of Alzheimer's popping up and they were saying that it's because our brain, something that something to do with like the myelin in our brain, which is, made up of saturated fats. So when we're not getting, when we're not eating saturated fats, we're literally like deconstructing the brain. And it's- Yeah, it's I could see that. I could see that. Um, and then also the other animal fats that, you know, typically don't come from plants as well. You know, the particular types of omega fatty acids and things. That makes sense. Well, that's good for me because I eat mostly saturated fats. So that's good. <laughs> Yes. Well, you got to keep your brain strong. That's what you do. Um, okay. So I know we're, run we're, we're running short on time already, um, but I did want to hear more about the not broth product that is coming out. Did you, wait, did you say not broth because we've talked about this or did somebody put you up yes. to that? No, I, I just watched the live. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. No, we, um, yeah, people still mess with me on that. That we were in like a meeting when we were first, we were talking about it and two people called it a broth. And I was like, I just want to put, I, I like stopped. I was like, I just want to put this out there right now. This is not a broth. This is a probiotic brine. And I went and did this whole <laughs> thing about it. So, uh, uh, but I can see how people could confuse it for a broth. Um, I mean, I guess it just depends on what your definition of a broth is, but I digress. Um, so, sorry, my headphone fell out. Very excited about that product. Um, I just love when we can create something that doesn't exist, um, you know, to push nutrition. I just mean, there's, I've never seen this in the human or the pet world. And so it, I, what drives me is new and better health outcomes and better ways of achieving those health outcomes. So, you know, I feel like for many years we've, you know, since I've started researching, you know, dog and cat nutrition, we, every year, every, everybody always knows the best diet, right? This is the best diet. This is the best fat ratio. This is the best, but we don't know. And it, it changes for every dog and cat. And we also don't know. So what really excites me about that is the ability to just kind of push nutrition into areas where we don't even have a premise for it. Like we're not, we're not really drawing off of anything in this product. Um, so, um, it's a little, it's for me, it's a little nerd project and we essentially just take mushrooms. We take cremini oyster and shiitake mushrooms and we brought, we put them in a brine until they ferment, which is going to be, you know, somewhere below a 4.6 pH. Um, so essentially you're just adding salt to it to bring the pH down. And then, uh, it's just really interesting because essentially every time you use a different bottle of this, you're going to get different probiotic bacteria. And it depends on a lot of factors. It depends on the mushrooms themselves, it depends on the type of yeast, the time of year they're fermented and what wild yeast might be in the air, you know, at the facility that's on a farm. Um, and so, uh, it depends on, you know, the soil type that the mushroom was 
was grown in or how they made that or organic soil. Um, and so it's really interesting to me because all of those will be soil based. So go back to your quote about eating dirt um, and you'll be getting hundreds of different types of bacteria. And, and it's your quote, not my quote. Yeah. And it's really about essentially creating as much diversity as possible. So the, the old, all we've ever heard about probiotics is your dog or cat has a digestive issue. So give them a probiotic. But what we want to do is for any animal, healthy, sick, we want to provide them with as much microbiome diversity as possible, as many different strains as possible. So that's where green juju comes in and you start to add in things like BAMS beets or mushroom probiotic or raw milk. And you're starting to get hundreds of different species of bacteria and good yeast. And that, that is also not just, Hey, let's make the microbiome diverse with some cultures. It's let's bring the environment back into their diet. Cause that's what we're all missing is. Um, and the cool thing is you can use it with anything with any other sort of, um, so what I, what I typically do is, you know, with this now too. So I, I use a lot of different foods that are naturally existing probiotics. And I know people use a lot of great, say like adored beast probiotics and things. You can use these all together. You can rotate between the adored beast probiotics while giving milk, while giving the mushroom probiotic, and you're just going to increase that diversity. And that's kind of what we're looking to do. And especially at Green Juju, we try to approach things differently. I also kind of wanted to, you know, we wanted to do something with mushrooms, um, but people are already doing great things with mushrooms in different ways. You know, there's tinctures, there's powders. Um, that's a whole thing apparently, but there's, there's tinctures and there's uh, powders, there's medicinal mushrooms. And, and we're, we're, um, you know, we're getting these medicinal benefits out of it. Um, but if we were going to do something, I wanted it to be completely different. And so this is really cool because we're, I think there will be the side benefit and I can go into that in a second, but we're primarily using this as a probiotic, which um, I think is really interesting. And the, the second part though, is whenever you make a brine from something, so whether it's like sauerkraut juice or like some of the juice that you get out of say Bam's beets in that brine, you're going to get nutrients. The nutrients are coming off of the beets or purple cabbage or whatever into that brine itself. So you're getting those vitamins and minerals. And with fermentation, it's all getting eaten. So they're pre-digesting that food. So I do think we, we will get, instead of like cooking the mushrooms, I do think we'll get some of the medicinal benefits as well um, in that brine. And then the other thing is you can also, the you can do the dose on the bottle, but you can always do more or less or whatever you want. Um, but it's pretty small, I think concentrated in terms of number of species. Uh, dose where, you know, it'll last a long time, but I know I'm going to be doing probably more. And I, I know um, once I, it's funny when you develop these things because I developed it and used it, but now there's this little time when like, it's, I just have to get up to the facility, which is like an hour and 15 minutes north of me um, to actually get it, to incorporate it every day, you know, moving forward. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use it as the baseline for diversity in my dog's diet and then I'm whatever else I want to do so if I'm you know my my daughter loves cocoa yo raw coconut yogurt I'll also do that or I'll do you know x y and z to increase the diversity but I think this is going to be like my baseline for diversity you know well I'm excited for it um to try with my dog and um yeah, I've just, like you said, you're always looking for something new and different to do. And so it's always fun to see what, what you're coming out with next. Yeah. And we, we definitely have some, some fun, you know, next, you know, three, four, we were planning way out. Uh, and I just think that, um, when me and Kelly go into these things and develop things together, we just have a very, um, uh, similar mindset and a similar view of like, Hey, let's really try to think outside the box and do things differently. So, um, I really enjoy doing that with her. So I can't, I can't complain. I get to do the best thing in the world, I think. So for me. Yeah. Well, and then look at how many people and pets benefit from it. So thank you. Um, yeah, super excited for that. Super excited for the frozen 
raw that's getting ready to hit shelves and actually might already hit shelves by the time this comes out. Um, but thank you for being my test subject. This was super fun for me. I don't know about you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I've definitely never done um, anything like this before. So yes, kudos to that. We'll, we'll see if it happens again. Um, but yeah, I thought it was fun. Uh, and I appreciate you being here. Of course. Anytime. Thank you.